So apparently if you wear one of these things, you have more credibility. Attending university in Canada has become almost mandatory at this point, with enrollment increasing every single year. You know what else has been rising right alongside it? Tuition. As a student myself, it seems that every day I'm trying to figure out different ways to avoid going into student debt to get my degree. All of this thinking inspired me to do a lot of research into how Canada got into the situation it's currently in, what the current situation actually is, and what can be done to help improve the situation across the board for every student. First, let's take a look at a recent history of tuition fees to try and understand how Canada from the 1990s went from charging $1,464 per year to now charging $6,463 per year for a university education, and that's just tuition. This is an increase of about 300% adjusted to inflation. It all started in the early 1990s when Canada and the rest of the world was hit by a recession. But unfortunately, Canada was in no position to handle it well. The country had been running consistent deficits of billions of dollars, hitting a peak in 1992 of a deficit of $40 billion. At that time, the total debt of the entire country amounted to 96% of Canada's GDP. So naturally, something had to be done about this, and in 1993, Jean Chrétien became prime minister and elected Paul Martin as his finance minister. Martin was able to do something incredible, and he flipped a $33 billion deficit into a $3 billion surplus in a matter of years. But in order to do this, he had to cut $12 billion of federal spending, and he ended up cutting $8 billion of federal transfers to the provinces who administer things like healthcare and education. While each province was affected in its own individual way, Canada's most populous province, Ontario, was already struggling with its own recession woes. So, in 1994, the old NDP government of Ontario got replaced by a new Conservative government led by Mike Harris. Harris promised to deliver a balanced budget, create 725,000 jobs, cut income taxes by 30%, and cut government spending by 20%, all without touching a penny of healthcare. Naturally, this would be a difficult feat for anybody to accomplish. Between 1992 and 1994, the NDP government had already begun to cut spending for universities for a total of $173 million. So with Harris's big promises, where would he be able to find cuts to prevent the recession from wreaking havoc on the province? Well, one such convenient place was post-secondary education. The Conservatives decreased transfers to universities by another $348 million, between 1995 and 2000, adjusted for inflation. So naturally, the universities weren't doing too great at this point, and they had to find somewhere to get their funding from, so where do they turn? The students. In the five years between 1995 and 2000, as one might have guessed, tuition prices increased by a total of 72%, indexed to inflation, this becomes a 57% increase. This was able to help universities and provided them with additional funding of $513 million. However, at the time, universities were told to increase their holdback funding in order to provide financial aid to students in need. So after factoring in this funding holdback of an average of about 20%, the universities only saw an increase in funding of $413 million, which did offset their $348 million loss. But in the same period, enrollment increased 8%, and universities were unable to maintain their faculty-to-student ratios, and some argue that this decreased the quality of university education for students in that period. This decrease in provincial funding caused universities' reliance on tuition fees to increase from 22% in 1991 to 41% in 2000 on average. At the time, Canada's largest university, the University of Toronto, was right in line with the average of about 40% of its funding coming from tuition fees. However, if we contrast this to present day and we look at the University of Toronto's operating budget for 2020, we can see that approximately 67% of the University of Toronto's total funding comes from tuition fees. Rob Pritchard was the University of Toronto president at the time that these cuts were happening, and he stated the following. Quote, the undergraduates are really the big losers here. Unfortunately, the new funds from the undergraduates did not improve the quality for them, it just mitigated the damage. Students were right to feel abused. End quote. So at this point, you might be thinking that naturally, students didn't get 300% wealthier over the course of the last 30 years. So something else had to change. 
The first major change was that the usage of Registered Education Savings Plans, or RESPs, began to increase from 16% in 1999 to 69% in 2020. In its simplest form, the RESP is just an education savings plan that is partially funded by the federal government. In short, it works something like this. A parent signs up for an RESP with a bank or investment manager, and they name a child a beneficiary. The parent will then contribute their hard-earned after-tax dollars until the child is ready to use it around the time that they turn 18. If a parent makes full use of an RESP in a given year and contributes $2,500, the government will match this by 20% and contribute $500. They will contribute up to $7,200 per beneficiary, which is known as the Canada Education Savings Grant. They also have a second incentive called the Canada Learning Bond, and essentially in the first year of your beneficiary being eligible, they will contribute $500, assuming that you contributed something. For the next 14 years until your child turns 15, they will contribute $100 for a total of $2,000. So by making full use of an RESP, the government could provide up to $9,200 of funding for post-secondary education. This is a pretty good deal for most, if not all, parents, but unfortunately not all of them can afford to do this. RESPs work very well for parents who already have a good income and can take advantage of the maximum benefits. Meanwhile, lower-income parents aren't necessarily able to do the same for their children. According to Statistics Canada, as of 2020, 48% of parents making less than $45,000 had saved something in their child's RESP. Meanwhile, this contrasts with 87% of parents making over $150,000 per year had contributed something into their child's RESPs. The average value of RESP savings was about $8,500 on the low end to about $23,000 on the high end correlated with income. So the RESP can be pretty cool, and for 17 and 18 year olds, it's a pretty good start. But the reality is that most RESPs will barely cover the first year of education-related expenses. But what about the other three years? Parents naturally will try and help out their kids as much as they can, but sometimes it just isn't enough. What are you supposed to do then? This is where the second noticeable change comes in. In 1999, the Ontario Student Indebtedness, uh, I mean, Ontario Student Assistance Program came in. According to their website, quote, the Ontario Student Assistance Program is a financial aid program that will help you pay for college or university. They offer students either grants or loans, and it ranges depending on your income. To try and understand a little bit of how OSAP works, let's take a look at some recent changes. In 2018, a new conservative government was elected, led by Doug Ford, who replaced the old liberal government led by Kathleen Wynne. As of 2017, Wynne had set up the OSAP program so that 98% of OSAP funding was in the form of grants and only 2% was in the form of loans. This helped pretty much all families making less than $160,000 fund some part of their education, and for families making less than $50,000, it funded all of their education. When the Conservatives were elected into office, they decided to revert this change because OSAP would cost the province $2 billion by 2020 if they just sat around and did nothing about it. So they slashed a lot of the things Kathleen Wynne had put into place, and the new budget went from $2 billion to $1.4 billion. They tried to mitigate this for students by forcing universities to decrease their tuition by 10% all across the board in 2019, and freeze tuition for the upcoming 2020 school year. The main changes to their OSAP rules were that now families making less than $50,000 would get 90% grants and 10% loans. The government also notably removed a six-month interest-free grace period after graduation, so now your loans begin to accumulate interest as soon as you graduate from university. So what has been the result of OSAP and other federal loan programs that help students subsidize their education? The unfortunate answer is that as of 2015, 51% of Ontario students graduated with some form of government loans, and 43% of Ontario students graduated with more than $25,000 of student loan debt. The numbers for 2020 will come out in about two years, but speculation is that now the average student loan is $28,000. If you went to university in the 70s, 80s, or 90s, it's very possible that you may have been able to pay off your entire education by working summers or a part-time job. So you might make the argument that students now are lazy and they could just work to pay off their degrees. In order to tackle this argument, I'm gonna look at a few things. 
First, it's important to note that about 33% of minimum wage workers in Canada are students between the ages of 15 and 24. This works out to 331,000 people as of 2018. Additionally, you'd be hard pressed as a student to find a job that's paying more than one or two dollars above minimum wage, so these numbers definitely don't tell the entire story. And most students will take these jobs because they have no choice but to work, and the good jobs are far and few in between. So with that background, let's get into the cost of education. The average cost of attending university in 2021 with rent, food, tuition, transportation, and technology was about $20,000 per year. This only applies for a student living away from home. The average minimum wage in Ontario is $14 per hour. If a student was to work 40 hours per week for 18 weeks, which is the entire summer, they would come home with $10,080 which works out to just about 50% of their total cost of attending school. Now let's contrast this to 1990. The cost of tuition at the time was $1,464 on average. In order to find out what living expenses might have been at the time, we can extrapolate backwards using inflation. So taking out just the living expenses from our 2020 number to attend school, we get $13,537. So if we take this number and plug it into this inflation calculator, we'll see that this was worth about $7,731.15 in 1990. So if we add this $7,731.15 with $1,464, we get a total of $9,195.15 of total annual expenses. Minimum wage in 1990 was $8.06, which, fun fact, if you adjust this to inflation, works out to $13.76, or basically zero wage growth. But if we use the same formula from before and we calculate our 1990 summer earnings, it would work out to $5,803.20. This works out to about 63% of the total cost of attending university. So in essence, the ability for a student to independently pay their way through university has decreased by about 13% in the last 30 years. So in the days before 2020 or even 1990, it's easy to see that it may have been feasible at one point to pay your way through university, pulling summer jobs and part-time jobs while you do school. But now a student would have to make the same amount of money working part-time while in school as they did over an entire summer. So if you calculate this hourly, that would be about 20 hours per week part-time while studying. I would also like to point out that there are some degrees out there that can be twice or even three times more expensive as the average, so in some cases the average can be a pretty mild scenario. For this next part, I want to talk about some other problems that the high cost of education can raise. Many students feel the negative effects of carrying a burden such as student loans at the ripe age of 18. Let's begin with mental health. According to a 2004 paper titled Student Debt and its Relation to Student Mental Health, Quote, students who work tend to have worse grades and join fewer societies than those who do not, end quote. Now, this fact isn't meant to be surprising, but if you know anything about workforce politics, you'll know how big of a disadvantage this is. What is the one thing that employers value the most, even if they don't say it? Your grades. And if you don't have the grades, where is the second place that they look? Your extracurriculars and involvement in university life. The two things that employers place the most value on are hindered while working in university. Furthermore, another thing this paper stated was that people from lower socioeconomic classes were putting off applying to university because they don't want to be burdened with the debt. This can also be extended to debt-conscious students who just don't want to go into debt or put any additional pressure on themselves or their family. Because debt can be such a big barrier, this hypothetical student might not end up getting a degree at all and get paid much less for the work that's not their first choice. Additionally, students who graduate with debt are disadvantaged from the get-go. Because regardless of how small a portion of their income might be going towards servicing a loan, this still puts them behind students who didn't have to take on the debt to graduate. I'm sure there are tons of people who see life as a competition and would be perfectly content with putting themselves at an advantage over somebody else. In a 2018 survey taken by RBC Economic Research, over 40% of students with debt said that they were delaying buying a home or saving for their retirement thanks to the loans, and 20% said that they were delaying getting married or having children. These are only some of the real impacts that student loans can have on graduates and on the economy overall. A 2003 study suggested that students are less likely to take on public service positions such as pro bono law when they are straddled with student debt. 
they're more likely to go into the private sector out that pays a lot more rather than their first choice of doing some public service work because they have to pay off their loans. By having fewer people who are willing to do this kind of work, it reduces the quality of life for society overall. Another change that has had an impact on students' behavior was the removal of the six-month grace period for OSAP. By removing this space, this can lead people to take whatever job they get immediately after graduation, rather than developing their skills further to better match their ideal career, or extending their job search to find a company that will be a much better match for them. This can cause graduates to take on work that is poorly paid and does not match the profession that they're trying to go into purely because they have to service these student loans immediately after graduation. And my last point about the effect of loans on students is that the more debt students have, the less likely they are to take entrepreneurial risks. It is fairly well known that as a society, we need these types of risk takers in order to help us progress and move forward into the next decade and century. By forcing students into debt repayment immediately after they graduate, we are effectively reducing the number of people willing to take on entrepreneurial risk. So with all of these problems, what can be done to improve the situation? Unfortunately, there is no simple answer. The ones that are often brought up involve talking about touchy subjects such as taxes or redistributing government funding or becoming socialist. I'm gonna start with the most extreme recommendation. Naturally, this will tick all the boxes for outrage from every side of the political spectrum. This is not the only approach, but it is definitely one to be considered and hear me out. Free public education is one of the solutions to the rising cost of education. If we look at other countries who are doing this right now, most of them are in Europe, and you will see that the taxes in those countries are in fact quite a lot higher, and the government does have quite a big say about where your money goes. So after doing a bit more research, I noticed that there are a lot of countries in Europe that offer free education and their tax rates are kept well below 50%. But these countries also consistently score the happiest nations on earth. They have a mindset of wanting to help out their own citizens and everybody regardless of their situation is well taken care of. This being said, taxes of over 50% are not necessarily the answer. An important point brought up in a 2012 paper called Paid in Full, who pays for university education in BC, brings up the fact that somebody with a university education will make more money over their lifetime, pay more income taxes over their lifetime than their high school counterpart. And that these additional taxes that a person generated from becoming a more productive member of society should be returned back into the education system. Some of the numbers stated was that in BC in 2012, a university education costed about $50,000, and that a graduate, male or female, would make $159,000 or $106,000 in additional tax revenue, respectively. If these resources were reallocated, it can be argued that post-secondary degrees pay for themselves. In practice, this is not the way that government funding works in Ontario or Canada, but I think it's a very interesting argument that bears a lot of ground. If resources were reallocated, what would be the effect of free education on our society as a whole? Well, as I mentioned, post-secondary graduates are more productive, earn higher incomes, and generate more tax revenue. Additionally, they use fewer healthcare services and are less likely to rely on social assistance. Higher graduation rates in nations are also associated with higher living standard, better health outcomes, and more community engagement. Everybody benefits. Now, outside of the social benefits, if we look at this from a moral perspective, free education would have the effect of breaking down class and income barriers and provide more opportunity for all citizens across the board. There are some arguments that for lower income students, their education problems begin before entering university, but they will also be the ones who benefit the most from having a free university education, regardless. Now, an argument against free tuition is that this isn't even students' biggest expenses. The bigger problem is the cost of living. This means that on top of eliminating tuition, we might also have to provide financial aid for various other expenses. This would require us to come up with a system to determine who is eligible for these things, and we already have some experience doing that using OSAP. 
In conclusion, the tax cuts, the government funding cuts, and the economic problems within the nation were some of the causes for this meteoric rise in tuition. One might wonder why the government decided to go after post-secondary education with such vigor. One explanation is that governments tend to appease their constituents in the here and now and prefer current consumption on things like healthcare to improve quality of life now, rather than investing in something such as education which will increase the prosperity of a province or a nation, but you might not see the results in years to come. This often makes higher education a very easy target for governments because the returns right now aren't very visible. We are doing a wonderful job of putting many of our own citizens at a disadvantage by saddling them with student loan debt, creating large barriers to entry for lower income students, and hindering the growth of our own economy by reducing the purchasing power, entrepreneurship, and job choices for new graduates. Every year, this burden of student loan debt is increasing, and as tuitions continue to rise, the burden will only become greater. Asking an 18-year-old to make such an important financial decision is like asking them to marry somebody who is 10 years older than them. We would probably caution them against doing it. So this begs the question, why are we willing to allow them to make a decision that will marry them to debt for the next 10 years of their lives? It's inconsiderate of us as a society to allow students to self-inflict these wounds when most of them don't have the financial knowledge to make a decision like this. There are many reasons that people may argue against greater funding for education. But if you were to ask any parent if they think that education should be less expensive, you would be hard-pressed to find a naysayer. All signals point to the fact that investing in the education of our future workforce and providing them with the freedom of choice without drowning them in student loan debt will have a net positive effect on society overall. Making this investment will allow Canada to continue to prosper, to break down barriers of inequality, and to once again make Canada a competitive country on the world stage. Thank you for watching this video. If you agree with some of what I said, please share it with as many people as you can and spread the word. Don't forget to leave a like, subscribe to the channel, and let me know your thoughts in the comments down below, and I'll see you next time.